Hello, and welcome to the video lecture for Chapter 20, where we're going to talk about the, in the interstellar medium, or as the title of the chapter says, Between the Stars, Gas, Gas, and Dust in Space. Okay, and we will talk about both gas and dust and what the difference between the two are. All right, so there's lots of beautiful pictures in this chapter, maybe even more than usual, because it, a lot of the famous pictures of astronomy from the Hubble telescope in particular are these gas clouds. They're some of the compelling things we can see in space. And we're going to kind of go through and, and explain those a bit while telling a particular narrative about the physical processes, the, the astronomical realities that lead to these beautiful pictures. Um, so there's a few to kind of start with here looking at in this picture We're seeing a lot of different phenomenon between you know, kind of the, these red clouds That are glowing in a particular way blue clouds that are reflecting light um, and so on right they're, they're, um, Representing different colors uh, as well as a number of other ideas. Okay, but Let's appreciate the beauty, but then kind of move on to the sort of the, ma the main topic of this chapter as well. All right Okay so we have another one. Um, this one I think I'll, I want to say a bit more about because I think it does highlight some of the ideas um, that we'll be getting to in the next couple of minutes. Um, for example, we have some clouds that are showing up as blue because they're reflecting light. Okay, we're seeing some um, well clouds really, but that look like gaps. This one, for example, because no visible light are passing through them. They're so dense, well, you know, relatively dense, that no light is passing through to be seen um, in this image, okay? Um, and then we also see um, some clouds that are sort of glowing in a red color, like this one around a large star. That would be um, Antares here, okay? So that those definitely represent the types of clouds we're going to be looking at. But ultimately just saying, oh, there's blue clouds and there's red clouds doesn't tell us much. So what, you know, what's the main takeaway here, okay? Well, here's an example of a particular type of cloud. Um, of nebula, whatever you want to call it, um, that is that is, you know, really does represent a specific type of uh, process in space. Um, so I want to I want to highlight this one as really kind of one of our first first examples, and this would be a ionized cloud. Okay, so in other words, the the gas that makes it up and of a specific element is ionized. Okay. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at an H2, all right? And it'd be two like a Roman numeral. Okay, so this is the, the key term here. And what that is is ionized hydrogen, okay? We'll be talking about hydrogen quite a bit, right? So hydrogen is really the number one thing we're going to see in space. By far, it's the most abundant element in the universe. So, you know, definitely, definitely, you know, don't forget that. I know we haven't talked about the Big Bang yet and that we should be expecting, you know, a lot of hydrogen in the universe. But notwithstanding, you know, we definitely, we, there is a lot of hydrogen. It's by far the most abundant element out there, okay? And so that being the case, that hydrogen can have different effects. You know, obviously it can make molecules, which we'll talk about, but it can also just get ionized. In other words, it's a single electron can get freed and that will make a gas that glows and it can glow in um, this, basically the visible spectrum. So it can, it can glow with particular colors that we, that we can see. And that, that has to do with the fact that some of the, sort of some of the energy states um, of excitation when you're, so you know, you, there's basically, you have your hydrogen atom, it's got that single proton that represents the nucleus, and that electron can get excited, and then eventually get so excited that it's ionized and the electron is free of the nucleus entirely. It's got enough energy that it's gone. But then eventually that, that electron is going to bump into another hydrogen atom and then it, you know, then it's some of that energy can get released as visible light. And some of those energy levels that can get released correspond to red light. And there's, and there's, there's also ones that correspond to light that we can't see at the human eye and so on. But in particular, we have a visible light coming from ionized hydrogen. All right. Um, this is not terribly common, although hydrogen is really common. Ionized hydrogen takes a lot of energy and is not definitely not the most common type of gas that we're going to see out there. Um, in the in space, okay, but definitely it's one of the ones we want to take kind of take note of first of that what 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 type of gas is out the in space between the stars? Definitely ionized hydrogen. It's it's going to be around particularly bright stars. So if you have a bright star, a lot of energy coming off of that star, that energy can can, can keep the gas around it ionized, creating an H two cloud, okay, or an H two nebula. A nebula is just a space cloud, okay. 
All right. So furthermore, you can have within these clouds that are around bright stars, in addition to visible light, because the hydrogen in those heat, you know, those heated clouds um, is, is outputting light, the, the cloud can also absorb light um, and, you know, it can absorb energy um, because some of that, some of the light can bump into those hydrogen atoms. And in doing so, there are absorption lines. And this is kind of given as a kind of often a, a key example of of emission spectra and absorption spectra. If you, um, in every, every astronomy textbook has this. And we, we've, we've mentioned the idea briefly when we did our kind of crash course on the basics of physics and astronomy. But the idea, you know, is if you can have a star and it, it, it glows and it has certain emission that it creates, and that's the rainbow of light because it turns out that the way the star glows is it really, it really produces every type of light, um, at least within a large bandwidth. Um, and then there's certain elements on the surface that absorb, line, absorb light, and those are the absorption lines. We've been talking those, about those ideas quite a bit with the HR diagram. And you can also then have something else between you and the star you're absorbing or observing <laughs> that is absorbing more light. All right? And that's a case of having a cloud in between the star and the observer. And the cloud then is going to, is going to absorb even more light. All right. And, and I said that is in contrast to emission. And I guess the, the direct contrast to emission is this red light in the Orion Nebula, for example, is created by emission. It's, it's those H2, those, those ionized hydrogen atoms that are actually glowing. All right. Because they're, they're creating the light through the excitation of their own electrons. But this is just in this case, the gas is just absorbing some energy. And so the effect is instead of emission, it's absorption. It's something we can still measure and detect and, and quantify, and it looks like this. It has little missing black bands that tell us, first of all, what the gas, the, what the cloud is made out of, and um, can even tell us things about you know how fast it's moving. And there's there's, all, there's lots of useful data that comes from it. But the important thing is just on a basic level, you can have a cloud between us on Earth as the observer and a star, and that cloud can absorb certain Band, bandwidths of light, certain uh, lines of light within the rainbow, and those correspond to particular elements in the cloud. Okay, and notice here, this is this doesn't say it is a interstellar hydrogen cloud. It's a dust cloud formed of many different molecules, and we know what molecules there are because we'll be talking about this. We'll be we'll be discussing. Oh, scientists know there's certain molecules that exist out in space. How would we know that? We would know that from this process of absorption. Okay, and furthermore. And your textbook does a good job of pointing out um, kind of what would be a good question. Well, how do, how do astronomers know that, that those absorptions are coming from a dust cloud and not just from the star itself? What actually has to do with the narrow lines? Because the narrow lines are because the dust, the dust cloud isn't spinning quickly like the sun is, or like the star is, excuse me. And the star then thus has broad absorption lines, and the cloud has narrow absorption lines. And so that those widths really, to, and the Doppler effect that creates those widths, um, you know, really kind of clear up which is which, you know, which is the the star absorption lines, and which is the gas cloud absorption lines, all right? So um, I do want to be clear here that these are different ideas. You know, they both maybe are referred to clouds that are around a bright star, right? So there's definitely, that's what, that's what these two figures have in common. But here, this, this is a hydrogen cloud, okay? You know, it heated up because it's near a bright star and thus emitting visible light, okay? Among also invisible light, but importantly, red light. This is a dust cloud, not hydrogen cloud, around a bright star that is absorbing light, okay? All right, but dust cloud is still a little bit not well-defined, but we'll get there in just a minute. Okay, okay, so now, another idea, another big thing that's going to be out there in space, and actually by far the most common, is neutral hydrogen. So the reason that neutral hydrogen is the most common is because, first of all, hydrogen is the most common thing in the universe. Already said that, right? But the fact that it's neutral just means it's not near a big energy source. So this is all the hydrogen that's out there in space. Um, we'll learn later, even between galaxies. But in this case, we're really concerned about between stars inside our own galaxy. Um, and that, that gas not being near a super, a super bright or hot star or anything like that is just in a neutral state. And that's by far the most common thing we mean. When we talk about the interstellar medium, most of it's neutral hydrogen. Okay, It is abundant um, it is out there in, in huge, huge quantities. It actually composes a big part of the mass of the galaxy. 
between 10, 10 and 15 percent of the galaxy mass is is just these clouds, these incredibly low density clouds. OK, now the way we detect it is this thing called the 21 centimeter line. All right. Um, here's a picture of the detection um, that was you know, developed um, and uh, uh, led to a Nobel Prize in physics in 1952 for the uh, for the successful detection of the 21 centimeter line. And it's kind of a cool name, 21 centimeter line. What is it? Well, it's essentially saying that this neutral hydrogen um, is hard to detect, but it turns out it has one telltale signal that we can pick up on Earth, and it's a radio wave. All right. And what do I mean by it being a radio wave? Well, I mean it's a it's radio waves are a form of light, um, and this is the same kind of radio waves like you would have on a radio. Okay. Um, and these radio waves are low energy light way more low energy light than visible light. And if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, I, I recommend if you're rusty on the idea of the electromagnetic spectrum, or if you haven't really picked up that's something we discussed here in the astronomy class, look it up real fast. Okay, look up the EM spectrum, and you'll see you have visible light, you've got higher, higher forms of light, higher energy forms of light like ultraviolet and x-rays, and you've got lower energy forms of light like microwave and radio wave. All right, well first infrared, then microwave, then radio wave going consecutively lower. Okay, so radio waves are light. They're made out of photons. The particles of light, all the same properties. There's low energy light, and since they're low energy, they're long wavelength. And 21 centimeters is, is way longer than visible light wavelengths. Um, it's not as long as they get, but it's long. Okay, it's it's kind of on the long end of microwaves. The actual light that comes out of your microwave oven in your kitchen is about three or four centimeters long. So this is, this is longer than that, but it's kind of on that, that level of light. And microwaves originally developed as a form of radio communication, and certainly 21 centimeters would fall under that category of actual usable radio communication wavelengths, all right? But it comes from space in abundance. And the reason it does is because this neutral hydrogen has one thing it does, because it's neutral, so it's not going to be getting ionized and you know, with the, the electrons jumping through energy states and releasing energy that way. But it turns out that there is a way it releases energy very gradually and at a much, much lower, lower energy level. And that's this idea that the nucleus and the electron can spin together in the same direction. And, and that's a lower energy state, okay, because they're spinning in a synchronized manner. And so what can happen, however, is that they can bump into each other maybe two of these neutral hydrogen atoms. And definitely that bumping process is rare because the density is incredibly low of this gas. And But when they bump together, there's energy imparted. And that energy then could allow the electron to flip and spin the opposite direction of the proton, in other words, the nucleus. And now this atom with its opposite spinning electron, opposite spinning electron right there, is in a, is an excited state, just subtly, like a very, very excited, but just there's a little, little, little bit of excitement. But gradually that energy will get released, okay? And gradually it's more, I mean like um, statistically there's a chance. And it takes a long time, it can take millions of years, but eventually it will return to an unexcited state and release a little bit of energy, which corresponds to light at the radio level. Okay, the 21, and specifically the 21 centimeter level. All right. And, and you know, so physicists know this, this can happen. This, this does happen. And now astronomers hey, say, hey, look, we found that line. That means there's a bunch of neutral hydrogen out there. They get a Nobel Prize because that's a big deal. We really confirm something and, it, you know, like the, the theory matches the observation. But, you know, it's a big step in science. Okay. So all you need to know is it's a really, really low energy process has to do with the spin of the protons and the electrons. You know, that's, that's kind of the, that's the idea, and it's, and it's abundant. Okay, okay? So, so far we've talked about ionized hydrogen and neutral hydrogen, hinted at molecular clouds, but let's move on, okay? So, another thing that we'll be kind of coming back to a couple times is that there's also really even hotter sections of the, um, of the interstellar medium. And these have to do mainly with the remnants of supernova. So supernovas are pretty common um, in the 100 billion stars out there in our galaxy alone. And as they blow up, they leave these really hot kind of like waves of gas that are pushing out. 
Um, they create a bubble. Well, I'll mention that bubble again um, at the very end of the lecture. Um, and so that's kind of like, because that sort of, it's, it's like a shockwave of energy. And you imagine then on that forefront of that shockwave of energy from the supernova is a bunch of hot gas that's rushing out at high speed. And that gas is kind of pushing all the other gas out of the way, leaving a kind of a, a gap behind. So really leaving on one of the lowest density regions of space until it eventually gradually gets filled back in by neutral hydrogen, all right? But in the meantime, that, that wave front of the, the remnants of the supernova is full of very, very hot gas. Very hot gas that's moving very quickly because it still has all that, that energy released from the supernova. So it's, been, it's just you know, shooting away at high speed. And that particular type of very hot gas actually emits quite a few X-rays. So there are a lot of X-rays out there in, when we look at the interstellar medium, X-rays that aren't coming from stars, X-rays that aren't coming from black holes or anything like that, just X-rays that are coming from the remnants of supernovas. And those remnants last for, for hundreds of thousands, millions of years and continue to emit X-rays the whole time. And I think it's important to bring up because we think about X-rays as being very high energy light, but this is X-rays coming from just gas. But it's, not, it's pretty unusual gas, right? Because it's supernova remnant gas, okay? I do want to say something, though, before, um, before we continue on about the neutral hydrogen is the density, the average density is one atom per cubic centimeter. And the temperature can vary, but the temperature is going to maybe be around 5,000 Kelvin, all right? And I bring that up because I, one of the homework problems addresses this idea that we have very low density, high temperature. Um, and high, this, this is hotter than the surface of our sun, but this is not a hot gas in terms of energy because it's so low density that even though the individual atoms have a high temperature, the actual heat content of this gas is very low. Okay, so it's kind of hinting at one of the, one of the interesting ideas that we can discuss quantitatively. Okay, all right, so supernova remnants, definitely part, part of the process and part of the, one of the key ideas of the interstellar medium, the thing between stars, okay? So furthermore, uh, one thing that can happen, so kind of circling back around to the dust clouds, um, well, not quite dust clouds yet. Let me rephrase that. Sort of a, maybe kind of an intermediate state is we can have molecular clouds. And molecular clouds are, happen when you have the hy hydrogen clouds that through usually gravitational processes, maybe because they got bumped by one of those shock waves of a supernova. So imagine you've got, you know, most, most of the galaxy is just this kind of this web of, of neutral hydrogen, but sometimes it gets pushed around and ends up kind of maybe crashing together, making a, a kind of a, a denser region of, you know, of gas, okay? And in doing so, because there's gonna be trace elements of things that aren't hydrogen, molecules will start to form. And molecules will particularly start to form when you have a protected region of gas. It's not near any hot stars. It was maybe pushed away um, and kind of pushed into a higher density um, conglomeration due to a shockwave of a supernova. And so that, that higher density protected region of gas can start to form molecules, all right? And I say that because the, if you have, say, like the H2 gas, right, the, that ionized hydrogen, you can't form any molecules because there's too much energy. If there's enough energy to ionize the, the hydrogen atoms, there's the, no way is there enough energy for molecules to, or, you know, I should put it this way, there, there's way too much energy for molecules to hold together because the ionization energy for those atoms is greater than the bonding energy for the molecules. So the energy that ionized the, hyd the hydrogen atoms would be plenty enough to tear apart the molecules. So you need, lower, you need lower energy regions of the galaxy and they certainly exist. And in those lower energy regions, molecules start to form. And we'll learn actually that you have to have those higher density, lower energy regions to even form stars in the first place. Because only once the molecules start to form can the gas clouds start to collapse under the influence of gravity. And it's such a fascinating kind of process that we can't get to it in this chapter, but we will um, later on when we talk about star formation. But suffice to say that in these molecular clouds, there's a whole, whole slew of interesting molecules that can form. You have um, ammonia, um, formaldehyde, acetylene, acetic acid, ethyl alcohol, benzene, even, um, even these, uh, these Buck, Buckminster fullerene balls, you know, which are very large uh, you know, carbon-based carbon molecules. So it's just really fascinating, just the wide variety of molecules just it, exist out there in the vacuum of space. Um, given, given the opportunity, uh, chemistry can you know, kind of find a way. All right? And this, it's not life forming in space, but these are still biological molecules that 
but then given other conditions could form life. So it's kind of fascinating, you know, how this, how all these, how, you know, this out there between the stars, we have chemistry that, you know, at least is a telltale marker of potential life. Okay. All right. So now I want to get into the dust part. Okay. So now we're moving on to dust. We mentioned dust just, uh, you know, a couple slides back only so that we could justify the technique of look of identifying absorption lines because only in identifying absorption lines can we make a claim that we can find something like fullerene because we can't go out there and take a sample the only way, only way we know that fullerene C60 so you know or even for you know maybe more garden variety ammonia exists in a molecular cloud is because of those absorption lines all right okay but one thing now going to key now we want to talk about maybe the more the basics of interstellar dust okay now dust is a bit bigger than a molecule Okay, a, a molecule maybe is just formed of, you know, 40 atoms, 60 atoms in this case, right? Dust is going to be formed of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, in, hundreds of, thousands of individual atoms. This is still a lot less than, you know, uh, than, you know like objects on Earth. You know, if you, if you actually see a piece of dust, like imagine a piece of dust in your house, that's, going to be, that's, that's composed of trillions of individ, individual atoms. So when we talk about interstellar dust, we're talking about very, very fine dust because it's the only hundreds of thousands of atoms or even tens of thousands of atoms per dust particle. So, the, I mean, this is the finest, finest scale dust, um, such fine scale dust that it doesn't exist on Earth, all right? Um, and except under maybe, maybe very, very specific circumstances. But in, uh, average on, on Earth, because of, you know, the atmosphere and the, the, you know, kind of the electrostatic processes and just the abundance of molecules in our atmosphere, dust, dust is bigger, okay? But in space, it's very fine, all right? But what it does, unlike... Atomic hydrogen, ionized hydrogen, even those molecular clouds that we just mentioned, is that it blocks a lot of light because it is it is composed of larger particles, and those larger particles can vibrate really at almost any frequency, so they can absorb all wavelengths of light. Okay, they can uh, they can absorb all wavelengths of, of visible light, um, and that's the idea of black body radiation. It's the same way that you know I, I can sit out in the sun and I'm essentially absorbing all wavelengths of visible light when I sit out in the sun. And then I'm radiating um, heat away in the form of infrared light. And the reason I can absorb all those different wavelengths is because I'm composed of all these molecules that can vibrate at every known frequency to match all the frequencies of the incoming light. Okay? Same idea with these dust particles. And so they make these black regions because they're absorbing all the light from behind them. Okay? There's stars behind this cloud, but it looks black because it's absorbing all that visible light. Visible light. Okay? All right? Um, so... You know, kind of um, just, you know, talking about absorbing this light or observing this light that is absorbing things. Here we have uh, a uh, Edward Emerson Bernard and his telescope. Okay. And these molecular clouds are beautiful. I think this is one of, you know, some of the most captivating pictures of these molecular clouds because you can get these in the visible spectrum. You can get these kind of like these beautiful features on, on bright backgrounds. It's just, it's, you know, inspiring, right? If we look in the infrared, the regions that were dark actually become bright, okay? Because just like, just like a person, like I said, me and the sun, I'm absorbing all the visible light, but then, I, my, then those molecules are vibrating themselves, the molecules that will you know, make up my clothes and my skin and my hair, and they're emitting infrared light. You could see it if you were wearing infrared goggles or something, right? You know? And that infrared light, which we, which we associate as heat, because that's like, that's like heat, heat sensing is, is looking in the infrared. And that, that light is, then being, is being, um, being emitted. And, that, and so essentially some of the energy is getting, is getting retransmitted from the dust. And it's, but it's coming in a different wavelength, a wavelength that doesn't correspond to visible light. It's infrared. It's lower energy, longer wavelength. Okay? And if, so if we have an artificially colored picture here in the infrared, then the regions that were dark in the visible, dark in the visible, become bright in the infrared, okay? This is looking at kind of the whole Milky Way and seeing that there's a lot, there's a lot of dust out there and there's a lot of infrared and there's pockets of it, okay? So even there's a lot of hydrogen, there's also a lot of dust, okay? It's more patchy, it doesn't, it doesn't it's not gonna make up the huge, huge mass, amount of mass that the hydrogen does, this, you know, but, but it's still spread pretty evenly throughout the, the entire galaxy, okay? And that's, that's what we're seeing in this figure, okay? So now two, two things that dust do, all right? And I think we can tell a nice story here. So we can think of the interstellar dust as having a big effect because, because the way, again, because the way it can vibrate at every, every frequency. 
it can, it can really act the same way that our atmosphere can act. So let's think about it. When you look up straight above you, you see a blue sky. But at sunset, you see a red sunset. Okay? That, but those two reasons, the reasons that the sky above you in the middle of the day is blue, but the sky as you look towards the setting sun right, right at sunset is red, is, are the same physical processes. And it's because the blue light is being scattered in both cases. And so when you look above, the blue light is being scattered because that's filling up all that scattered light is then what you're seeing. That scattered light is then you know, getting reflected and coming, coming to your eyes, your, you know, the optical sensors that are your eyes. At sunset, that blue light is getting scattered and getting scattered away from you. So as, you, as then your line of sight is missing the blue light because it's getting scattered to all the people that are above and, above and below it, right, that are different places on Earth that aren't seeing the sunset at that, that exact time, right? And there, so then you're just seeing the red light that wasn't scattered because there would be leftover red light if all the blue light was scattered, right? So same processes, just different locations relative to where those processes occur. Okay? And I have a figure, I think, that will show that nicely. So here we have the looking up straight above you in the middle of the day and seeing blue. This is scattered light. These are dust clouds that are scattering blue light. Okay? Now, here's the one that was dark before, the same big dust cloud. But here we are looking at it in the infrared. And you might say, oh, well, you don't have to look at the sunset in infrared. That's true. All right. You could, there's some of the red, the light is still visible red. In this case, we, it's not quite visible. You have to actually look at the infrared, but infrared is just a little bit redder than red. All right. But the point is, this is, this is the, the red light that is making it through because all the blue light is getting scattered off to the side. I'm sorry. All right. So all the blue light is getting scattered off to the side. All right. So here's the picture. So here's the thing. It's all about line of sight. So in this figure, you're right here. The blue light is getting scattered to the sides and you're not seeing the blue light. Instead, you're just seeing the red light that passed through the cloud. Okay, and then you use a special infrared camera and you see the, all the stars behind with only their red light being transmitted effectively through the dust cloud, the interstellar dust cloud, okay? Whereas the, this interstellar dust cloud that looks blue isn't a different type of dust. We're just looking at it from a different angle. This is looking here. Now you happen to be lined up with that dust cloud from the side. And when you, from the side, then you're catching all that scattered light. And you see a dust cloud that appears blue. So it's all just about angle of observation, where Earth is relative to these different clouds, whether they appear blue or red. Same dust clouds, though. Same processes, scattering of light in both cases, okay? All right, and by the way, that whole idea of scattering, scattering is kind of just code for that idea of the fact that a dust particle can vibrate at any frequency of light, and, but it can only transmit, retransmit in the infrared, okay? Which probably sounds a little complicated. That's why it's, probably, it's more easy to just think of it as scattering, okay? This picture is kind of a nice, nice story to tell, okay? And there is directionality to it, just like in the picture. All right, so... This is what dust particles look like. Um, kind of the, po the point here is they have a core, which is um, sort of metallic, and then they have um, icy molecules. So this would be um, hydrogen, hydrogen ices, hydrogen compound ices, they're called. So some of them are true water ice, but you can also have other forms of ice. These will all be still hydrogen compounds. Um, and that, that's, that's also what we, when we talk about like, you know, the Jovian planets, and we talk about them being icy, we're not only talking about H2O, we're also talking about these other other common uh, molecules, okay? And see, like, um, let's see, yeah, so the NH3 is, uh, that one's ammonia, okay, for example, this one, it's ammonia, okay? So, the point here, besides being, okay, yeah, so it's got a metallic core, right, and kind of a, an icy mantle to it, is, again, that it's so small, that this whole thing is only composed of, say, you know, 10,000 individual atoms, okay, so incredibly, incredibly fine dust. Okay, um, I want to briefly mention cosmic rays. So cosmic rays, um, the, the reason they're in this chapter is because they're, they're high energy charged particles and they have to do with these kind of this idea that gas, gases in space, if they're not protected from all these high energy charged particles, then they're, they're not just going to remain as neutral hydrogen. Um, and so these, these high energy charged particles are racing through space. They come from, you know, probably the same sources as the x-rays, like, you know, previous supernovas and so on. And they're, they're kind of part of this process of just spreading energy throughout the galaxy. 
Um, and they were discovered because our atmosphere absorbs them really well and our, our magnetic field on, on Earth redirects them. But if you, you know, go up in a balloon in the uh, 1800s or you know, early, early uh, 1900s, then it turns out you can detect more of them. And that was a big discovery. And they're out there, lots of charged particles. Okay? Um, but moving on. Um, this, this is looking at the whole um, galaxy and looking at all that neutral hydrogen in green. Um, the yellow regions are going to be um, where we have molecular clouds because those are higher density kind of protect, protecting themselves due to their density and maybe just because of their, their proximity. So these higher density molecular clouds are where stars can start to form. All right, but all the green regions are that neutral hydrogen. Okay. Um, interestingly too, the, um, the molecular clouds are going to be cooler, even though they're denser, which also kind of seem, might seem counterintuitive, but it all has to do kind of where the energy is going. Some energy is getting lost to, uh, to gravitational contraction. Um, and, but, but then there, it's also cooler because it's radiating energy away sometimes. Okay. Ideally, um, this is this is looking at X-rays. Um, kind of the, the takeaway here. This is um, getting to the last the last kind of uh, section in your book, um, which is in this in this chapter twenty. That is, um, which is let's see, we were at uh, twenty point four, I think. Let's see, interstellar grains. Um, twenty point five. Uh, what was that we just talked about? Twenty point five is kind of the life cycle, um, the higher higher density regions. But in our, our immediate um, neighborhood is 20.6. And if we look at you know, uh, the, the sky around us, we see a lot of x-rays. And that's because we're actually in a region of the galaxy where we're in one of those bubbles left over from supernovas. Kind of interestingly, we're, we're in a, a, a less common type of, or, you know, type of, or part of a spiral arm of the galaxy. So if we look at this picture, and it points out that these little blue gaps, like right here, these are bubbles. These are bubbles that were formed from supernovas. And we're, our star is currently in one of those bubbles. What's also quite interesting is the time scale for stars to pass through bubbles and then to go, say, to regions of, of neutral hydrogen and then maybe pass through another region of molecular gas. They're only tens of thousands of years. We're not talking millions of years. So it's actually quite interesting that the, the surrounding medium changes over a relatively you know, short time span, considering astronomical time spans of billions of years, it's just tens of thousands of years for stars to pass, you know, from one very different interstellar medium into another. Because all these, medi all these mediums are kind of swirling around each other. They're all generally moving in the circular motion of the galaxy, but, but due to their own forces and, you know, explosions and so on, they're, they're not, you know, moving perfectly. It's like a swirling mass. It's, you know, it's a mess of ups and downs and different directions and, and, and sp almost waves and crests and, and condensations and gravitational pulls. All, all while experiencing the main gravitational circular motion of the galaxy, you know, and the condensation of mass, or the you know the centralization of mass at the center of the galaxy. Okay, but the point is that we're we're in one of these supernova bubbles, and kind of a good evidence of that is a preponderance of X-rays around us, which wouldn't be true of every every part of the galaxy. And here, and this is kind of our local region. Um, we're, we're in a part where we, it's called the local fluff. So since we're not in a kind of relatively high density. Um, and relatively high density, that would be the one um, or one atom per cubic centimeter. All right, one atom, excuse me. Um, there. So we're not in the region of one atom per cubic centimeter. We're significantly less than that. And that's why it has this term local fluff. So we're not totally devoid of atoms. There's no part of, of the galaxy where there's no atoms, but we have significantly less than one atom per cubic centimeter where we're at, where our star is located. And um, that's why it's called fluff, because it's so, it's so low density. Um, you know, and this, this is already incredibly low density, one atom per cubic centimeter. But we're in a region where it's, it's going to be a fraction of that. Uh, 0.3 atoms per cubic centimeter is our kind of region. Okay? Um, and that's, you know, that's sort of a, this is a, a pocket of gas within the bubble that we're currently in, but only will be in for another 10,000 years or so. And then we'll move into um, more of the true, you know, hydrogen atom um, or neutral hydrogen atom gas region of uh, the galaxy. Okay? So, I, I mean, I think the ideas in this chapter are actually kind of subtle, more so than, than many of our other chapters. Uh, I, hope they kinda, I hope they kind of sink in. I tried, I tried to piece together some of the key stories, whether that was, you know, explaining how dust clouds can be both blue and red, um, how we have kind of the two different types of hydrogen, the, um, the neutral and the ionized, and how that leads to different observable colors. Um, so try to focus on that. Try to focus on the key stories rather than just kind of a, a survey of information. Um, and then, uh, you know, check out the quantitative problems that I, I put in for the chapter as well, because I think that helps uh, reinforce some of the ideas. Um, most importantly, thank you for watching this video. I hope it was interesting, and I will talk to you all soon.